Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Matt Masunas from Connecticut Green Bank. Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, and to everyone this holiday week who wants to know more about energy affordability. Uh, in the scheme of Connecticut Green Bank's 2021 webinar series, it'd actually be a huge disservice not to address the issue of affordability. We're talking about a necessary commodity here to simply live life and participate in society. And clearly in the last 16 months, uh, residents and businesses in Connecticut saw affordability hardships that even went beyond the steady state dialogue that Connecticut and New England customers are used to having on energy affordability. It's such a sweeping issue uh, that we wanted to get focused today on the residential sector specifically and not so much dissect all the different causes of energy market prices today, but instead get into a situational uh, analysis, uh, informing people about resources and the ongoing efforts uh, to help our residents live their lives comfortably and within oftentimes limited budgets. Uh, so I recognize I'm an imperfect messenger for this and any issue practically. So I wanna introduce you to some experts who can uh, fill out the picture for us. Uh, and I'm going to learn more this hour and I'm gonna bring the audience along with me. So let's get going. Uh, our first panelist today is gonna be Alicia Jenkins. Uh, she's an emerging scholar, a freelance teaching and performance artist, poet, writer, and activist. Ms. Jenkins is Sierra Club's uh, Connecticut chapter's Ready for 100 campaign organizer. Ms. Jenkins is a Trinity College graduate, currently residing in Hartford, Connecticut, uh, where she's lived for the past 11 and a half years. Uh, she's a proud African-American feminist who believes in the power of liberation of Black and American descendants of slavery families. Ms. Jenkins advocates to change the world one city at a time by way of environmental justice. I had fun with that bio. Uh, onto the middle tile representing the great seal of the state of Connecticut, uh, Stephanie Cohane oversees the Clean and Affordable Energy Unit, Connecticut's Public Utilities Regulatory Authority, Pura, uh, where she works on a range of technical and policy matters before Pura, including their equitable modern grid initiatives and rate design reforms. Uh, Stephanie leads their electric vehicles proceeding and facilitated a series of 100-day sprints aiming to improve utility energy assistance programs. Stephanie's worked for over a decade on energy and environmental issues, and prior to joining Pura, she's held positions in state government, consulting, and the nonprofit sector. Last and uh, quickly turning into a semi-regular on uh, the Green Bank's webinars here is Brenda Watson, the Executive Director of Operation Fuel Incorporated, a statewide nonprofit that provides energy and utility assistance to struggling low to moderate income households. Uh, Operation Fuel provides assistance with all home energy sources, including water, utilities, and the replacement of home systems. Watson's professional career spans 20 years in the areas of transportation planning, municipal government, community organizing, program planning, as well as development and fundraising. Uh, welcome today uh, to all of our guests uh, and to the audience. Please feel free to send us questions or points to highlight as we go along, and we'll have that populated for the Q&A section uh, for after the presentations. Uh, so everyone, welcome to the conversation. We're going to start today uh, with Ms. Jenkins. Welcome. Good morning, or afternoon, rather. Good afternoon to you. And my name's Alicia, not not Alicia, Alicia. Hi. I practiced it 20 times, Alicia, and then the one time on execution, I messed it up. So this is why we we're calling in the experts to teach our audience some things. So, <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Um, hello, good afternoon, Connecticut. Um, my presentation will be about energy burdens. So next slide, please. So what is energy burden? It's household energy expenditures, electric gas, healing over household income. So energy burden above 6% of income considered is considered high and above 10% is considered severe. Next slide, please. So energy burden, who, it, who is impacted and what contributes to energy burden? So the average energy burden for low-income households is 8.2%. And energy burden often increases for those who live in older, draftier homes, excuse me, homes who have older, less efficient, uh, less efficient appliances, and who are renters. Next slide, please. 
So here's the energy burden statewide. Um, and as you can see uh, with the key down below with energy burden, you have the two, zero to 2%, two to 4%, six to eight, 8% eight and plus. So the areas that are often energy burden within the state of Connecticut and with, any, with many states throughout the United States are often cities. So Bridgeport, New Haven, Waterbury, Hartford are heavy with the energy burden sectors within the state of Connecticut and other areas too, like Torrington and, and New Britain are also energy burden, but majority of the cities within uh, Connecticut are energy burden. And we're gonna focus on Hartford today. Next slide, please. So the city of Hartford, average energy burden of 6.3%, which is high, versus 3.7% statewide. 21 out of 22 census tracts with high energy burdens, less than 6%, a majority Black, uh, greater than 6%, sorry, a majority Black and or Hispanic or Latinx. 67,000 people live in high energy burden census tracts in Hartford, over 50% of the city's population. Next slide, please. So this is the energy burden within the city of Hartford. Um, I am a current Hartford resident. I've been living here 12 years will be in August. So right now, 11-ish years. And as you can see on the map, this is the direct like map of the city of Hartford, where you see Kenny Park and Albany Ave, that's the north end of Hartford and Blue Hills Avenue, north end of Hartford. That area is, is um, heavy, heavy with energy burden within the city. And then the south end, which is where I used to live when I moved to Hartford in 2009. Um, Maple Ave, I used to live there. Washington Street, I used to live there. Oh, that, that whole area, unfortunately, is energy burden. Next slide, please. Energy burden and redlining. So, there is some historical context to this. So as you can see, um, the historical red line areas, there are some of those areas that used to be impacted by the racist housing um, that occurred back in the 50s and 60s within the city of Hartford or within the United States. And unfortunately, redlining affected this good blue liberal state. Um, and those areas that were historically redlined back then were used to be predominantly black areas of the city. Um, right now, there has been a gradual um, move. So I live in downtown Hartford, which is predominantly um, not, at, not energy burden, um, but there are still some areas that used to be historically redlined that are now energy burden, such as areas in the North End. Um, and there are areas on the South End of Hartford, which back in the day, historically, not many African-Americans lived on the South End um, during redlining times. Um, but because of a large influx of Latino people, um, America, well, Hartford has energy burden in areas um, on the south end. So it doesn't matter if you're black or Latino, if you're if you're in poverty, you're living in energy burden areas within the city. Next slide, please. So the race and ethnic demographic, like I said, the north end of Hartford, which is green, that's predominantly black, and then the south end of Hartford, which is yellow, is predominantly Latinx. Um, and downtown Hartford is, is definitely uh, predominantly white. Next slide, please. So right here is the asthma rates. Um, this is important because the mirror plant, which is the trash incinerator, which is located in Hartford, has been in existence in Hartford for quite some time and has affected the air quality within the city. And notice on the north end of Hartford, which is Albany Ave, as the highest um, asthma rates 
within the city of Hartford. It's very concentrated. And Mira used to be located not too far from that area within the city of Hartford. I think now they have, they're working on getting rid of it, um, but I am, I am willing to see what they do in the near future. And I hope that these asthma rates go down. But um, as you can see, the places where asthma is, is high, it's energy burden. Next slide, please. And these are eviction rates within the city. Personal story, and I'll make it quick. I suffered eviction notices since living in Hartford. I suffered three of them. And I had to force to think about whether to afford my light bill or rent. Um, so even though I live in downtown Hartford, there's a small percentage of Black and Latinx that live in downtown Hartford. And those of us who do, sometimes we experience energy burden because it's shrouded in the majority of the people that live in downtown Hartford, people oftentimes don't think that it exists. Um, I've experienced it. And so this is something that I'm living. I'm living the data that I'm presenting. I've lived the data that I am presenting to you. So, and as you can see, unfortunately, eviction rates, North End and South End. So yes, um, next slide, please. So this is very important. Um, as you can see with this, this is based off statewide income brackets. And as you can see, people who have the highest energy burden cost earn the less. So these numbers show between zero to 50,000 a year. People are earning less than 50,000 a year, but yet have high energy costs and are bearing the burden of energy costs within the city of Hartford and within the state of Connecticut. But a lot of it is concentrated within Hartford and New Haven and Waterbury. But I know that in Hartford, the average uh, income, the, the low average income is 30K a year. That's very, very, very um, sad that people are earning that and they are not able to afford their energy costs. Next slide, please. So putting faces to the data, prime example, I've experienced this and since living in Hartford and um, luckily I'm not in that space anymore, but this is very, very dear to me. In the fall of 2021 collaborating, with Liberal Arts Action Lab with Capital Community College and Trinity College. That's what Sierra Club is gonna be doing in the fall. And we're gonna work with them to add additional data, utility shutoffs, energy efficiency, completed projects. And we're gonna interview residents. How does energy burden impact their, li and their lives? What solutions do they want and need? And in the winter of 2021, we will share our results. So look forward to that. Next slide, please. And so I'll make this quick. Transforming from energy burden to energy ownership. So this is part of our campaign plan that Sierra Club, at Ready for 100 Sierra Club Connecticut will be hopefully doing in the near future. So right now, energy burden, identify and work with energy burden neighborhoods in Hartford, energy efficiency, prioritize energy burden neighborhoods in Hartford for energy efficiency and clean energy retrofits, clean energy jobs, workforce development and job recruitment is prioritized for residents of energy burden. Neighborhoods in Hartford, energy burden ownership by 2035, residents of energy burden neighborhoods own energy sources and businesses that deliver efficiency, solar and renewable services. Next slide, please. And this is our, this is where we got our data from. Next slide, please. And this is just it in words. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Alicia Jenkins. Ms. Jenkins, we really appreciate that. I'm looking forward to getting back uh, in the uh, tail end of this webinar and hopefully we'll have time to unpack uh, further some more of those issues. For example, the uh, redlining legacy that 
uh, is coming to many folks as a revelation uh, lately and how that might tie into energy costs uh, and burdens right now, as well as um, what the Sierra Club is doing uh, with uh, some of those solution-based uh, approaches. Uh, next, we have Stephanie Cohen. Uh, Ms. Cohen, uh, whenever you're ready. Great, thanks Matt and the Green Bank team for uh, putting this webinar together and for having me today. It's just great to be able to participate alongside these fellow presenters and experts really on a, an important topic. So thanks for taking the time to highlight um, these important issues. So next slide, please. And I think you can skip this one too, yeah. So I was just thinking about um, as being tasked with kind of uh, someone to, to bring folks up to speed if they're not already aware of uh, a variety of different um, kind of program and related resources that exist today um, for folks ex um, seeking energy assistance, residential customers seeking um, utility customers seeking energy assistance in Connecticut. And um, I kind of kind of came up with this category categorization or grouping, um, the, which I'm going to focus on today is the the kind of square box in the top left of utility bill assistance as. Folks may not um, may or may not be aware. Pura is uh, regulates the uh, electric, gas, water, and parts of telecom, um, and so our kind of purview or relationship to um, overseeing the utility bill assistance and related programs. That's kind of our most direct link. But I I would be remiss if I only focused on that and and didn't at least. Um, acknowledge that there are many programs and resources um, beyond direct utility bill assistance that are available and there's a lot of great work being done in these different areas. So just kind of to gloss over them at a high level, I'm happy to talk more if there's questions, um, if there um, is something that Pura can help answer, happy to do so. But on the energy efficiency side, um, there's the conservation and load management program that is um, implemented by the uh, electric distribution and gas local gas distribution companies and, and overseen um, by the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Um, so as a relevant uh, com kind of program component, there's the home energy solutions for income eligible um, folks who get a, a free home energy assessment if they meet, I believe it's the 60% um, state meet and income level for a household or, or less. Um, then there's a, a, a variety of different ways for um, interested residential customers to participate in um, renewable energy or other distributed generation uh, programs and projects that are, that are ongoing throughout the state. Um, Green Bank is a, is a definitely um, great resource in, in that respect, um, as well as there's a, a somewhat recent um, Shared Clean Energy Facility Program that the uh, electric utility companies are um, beginning to implement and offer that will have a, um, a component or participation component for low to moderate income uh, cost residential customers. Then um, uh, kind of an, another very important um, piece of the, the pie in terms of programs and services provided, we have fuel banks like um, Executive Director um, Watson, uh, who's on the line for Operation Fuel, but also there's a, a, a network of, of fuel banks across the state. And then in addition to that, there um, the Department of Social Services um, oversees uh, Connecticut Energy Assistance Program, or SEEP, which is our Connecticut's allocation of federal um, uh, LIHEAP funds, and the in partnership with a network of uh, local community action agencies statewide um, funds are uh, dispersed uh, to um, customers seeking energy assistance for primarily for winter heating um, bills um, throughout the year. So with that um, kind of high level overlay, uh, next slide, please. Um, I'll just uh, first talk about um, kind of a, I don't want to say precursor, but essentially a key component of um, for individuals uh, interested in and uh, seeking energy assistance from their electric um, utility company, for example, the, the term or the designation of hardship um, comes into play and it isn't important. And so just wanted to spend a moment uh, talking about kind of what that what that means and what that looks like and, and how to apply if it's something that's um, relevant to, to you or so, someone you know situation. And so 
essentially there's a, a statutory protection for income eligible customers from November 1 through May 1 against shutoff even if um, there's a, a bill non-payment um, situation and that's all often referred to as a winter protection or winter protection plan but in order to to um, have that apply to your account um, customers must um, meet one of the following uh, criteria well, that's listed on the slide I'm not going to kind of tick through each one but um, there's basically varying um, uh, eligibility um, requirements again that the customers would need to, to meet one of those and at this point in time can work directly with their utility company to provide that kind of proof of documentation um, and then essentially what happens is their account gets um, coded as hardship um, in the back end of the system if you will so that um, come this November 1 to May 1 period if there's a, a bill non payment situation um, the customer is account is protected from shut off. Now this can also be um, done through, with assistance through the community action agencies uh, network as well. But in order to um, be able to access and participate in a couple of the um, utilities offered energy assistance or, or bill repayment type programs, um, this kind of prerequisite or designation of hardship status um, it is required in some of the cases. And so that's why I just wanted to spend a moment here talking about this kind of important piece of the, the puzzle that um, may be you know, difficult for, for customers to um, recognize um, is a step and then and in, in terms of getting it completed and having it kind of reflected on their bill so that they are protected from shutoff in, during the coldest um, months of the year. Um, and next slide, please. So, so there's um, a lot packed in on this uh, slide and I'll just um, want to be cognizant of time. So I'll kind of try at a, at a high level to, to talk about some of the different um, offerings here, but these are all utility. Well, I guess uh, three of the four are utility based um, bill assistance programs. The, the, ex the exception is the Connecticut, the SEEP, the first col column on the left here, um, which I, as I had mentioned is a, um, program overseen by the Department of Social Services. Um, and there is essentially um, a, a payments, a direct payments to the that end up going to the utility on behalf of a customer's account. These can for heating assistance. So this can be for electric or gas heating customers. Also, um, the program covers um, customers with delivered fuels. But aside from that program, they have the a match in the, both utilities um, uh, electric distribution companies and the gas distribution companies offer um, the matching payment program or MPP, um, which is connected to participation um, in receiving funds through the SEAT program. And essentially that's as a way to kind of leverage um, a, an existing um, additional federal funded resource. And so provided that a customer is eligible for the matching payment program and is um, obtained or will obtain SEEP funding, you know, is actively participating in that program. The MPP program is um, open to electric or gas heating customers. So if you are an electric um, customer with um, a delivered a fuel oil, for example, your, your electric utility bill can't pay, participate in matching payment, just the um, heating portion of that. So um, if so for electric customers, both utility um, utilities offer a uh, balance forgiveness uh, program. So the kind of formal term that you may have heard or seen um, in docketed proceedings appear or other other places is um, a rearage forgiveness. But essentially that means um, getting on a, a payment plan um, an agreement with the utility company through one of these three kind of primary um, programs offerings um, to pay down that um, past due balance over a certain period of time. And if you know the, the components of that program or, or parameters are met, then there's a bill forgiveness um, component um, that's available as well. And so the different um, benefits you can see here is, is a kind of row in the kind of column of this table kind of comparing these different programs. Um, but for, for Eversource and UI, they both offer for electric customers um, that meet the 
again, kind of the eligibility, again, so finding this is where financial hardship um, is important to have, um, to be able to participate in these programs in a certain past due balance. Um, and this, uh, this is a year round uh, program that is available. I will say in addition, it's not reflected on this slide, but on a, a slide mentioned previously, in addition to these um, programs, there is the ability for customers to call their um, electric utility company and ask for a either a budget billing um, plan, where, which would be uh, you know paying the same amount um, every month. Um, so they basically kind of calculate what your average historic based on past historical use would be and try to spread out. So if there are some months where your utility bill might be higher or lower, um, depending on weather and, and usage, um, to kind of even that out, that's kind of a budget billing um, component that is available to, to um, any customer, as well as uh, the ability to enter into, um, a, a, into a payment arrangement for um, repaying a, a past due accrued balance. And I'll, I'll talk, I think next slide actually, I'll get into that a little bit more. Thanks. So the previous slide covered kind of um, maybe more longstanding um, energy assistance programs and resources that are available to cust eligible customers. This slide is intended to kind of capture um, at a high level some of the offerings and response um, from Pura and, and the utility companies in response to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So there was, um, Pura issued a shutoff moratorium back in um, middle of March of last year for all regulated electric gas and water utilities. Um, for residential customers, I will say that um, utility shutoff, the plan for utility shutoffs has not yet been approved. Um, but that's something that is uh, um, uh, before before Pura or will be before Pura. Um, and aside from that, the shutoff moratorium, it was also, um, Pura felt it was also important for the companies to offer an additional um, specific payment arrangement. We're calling the COVID-19 payment plan. So this was um, or is still um, active for customers who signed up during the enrollment period for any residential customer who, who requests it. So there weren't um, income eligibility uh, requirements like some of the other programs, the matching payment program, for example, I had mentioned. And um, so long as a customer was participating um, or paying the amount agreed upon and established the COVID, COVID payment plan, which could extend repayment terms up to 24 months, whereas typically the utilities were offering up to a 12 month period. So it just gives you more time to pay back if you have a higher balance um, with no fees or other interest kind of accruing on top of that. So as long as you're kind of participating in this um, monthly payment um, plan, then those customers are also would also be protected from any um, shutoffs um, if, should they be scheduled at that time. Um, the last program that I, I just wanted to again touch on briefly here um, is a result of uh, some some federal funding coming to Connecticut, and they're called the Unite CT. Program. So this is really targeted for rental assistance, which also does include electric utility bill payment assistance for qualifying um, Connecticut households, again, that were impacted by a COVID-19 pandemic. So you can see on the slide here that um, that eligibility requirement is, uh, is slightly different. It's based on area median income. And so it really depends on where you're living in the state. And if you go to the Unite CT um, website off the Department of Housing. They have, you know, details of um, eligibility depending on where you live. Um, but what that means for electric utility bill payments is um, for renters, again, this program is targeted for renter, rental assistance, is up to $1,500 for, um, to go towards any past um, accrued bill, electricity bills, as well as um, up to $10,000 for rental assistance per household. And, and in this program, you have to, um, work with your landlord to apply. And so there's lots of details and, and assistance provided um, if, if anyone is interested in that program. And as I understand, there's still um, lots, of, lots of funding to be dispersed. So um, definitely something to, to, to um, take advantage of if it's of interest and applies to your situation. Next slide, please. 
So this is just a, um, for those of you who are perhaps heard about something or interested in learning more about what else Pura is doing um, on the topic of related to residential energy affordability specifically, um, not gonna uh, kind of tick through each of these, but I will mention a few just highlights and again, happy to talk about anything in more detail if there are questions. Um, but each year, Pura, one of the things um, that we review is um, the electric utility and gas distribution utilities um, arrears forgiveness program. So their annual matching payment plan um, program design, if you will. I mean, it, it's based in a statutory um, framework, but there there are um, piece components that can be um, proposed by the utilities to be modified year to year. And so that this docket 210701 this year is where we're currently actually, it just um, opened last week, um, kind of we'll be discussing these various um, potential program uh, modifications. There's also an ongoing proceeding um, that came out of uh, in part the, the Take Back Our Grid Act, which passed in the, the special session by the legislature in the fall of 2020. Um, and one of those provisions um, uh, kind of directed Pura to consider the implementation of a low income discount rate. So the programs that I mentioned today are all energy assistance for um, once a customer kind of finds themselves in a position of having a past due balance, but a low income discount rate is, is another way of potentially um, addressing the issue of energy burden as, as Alicia was talking about uh, ahead of time. So just trying to, to find different ways of, of tackling th this problem facing Connecticut res uh, residents. Um, and then I had talked a little bit before about the, the COVID-19 response and, and various um, requirements for outreach and communication, things like that of the utility, that's all being um, done and tracked by Pura through um, another docket here. So I have one last quick slide. Um, next slide, please. And I again can follow up if there's questions. Um, but uh, would be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to also kind of make sure folks, if any of what I just mentioned is of interest or would like to, to learn more, we certainly have uh, different ways for, for folks to reach out. Um, we have, um, as of just over a year now, an Office of Outreach, Education, and Enforcement. Um, so they, um, that group is well equipped to handle um, customer complaints. Um, if you know a customer reaches out to a utility and it is, is running into an issue, we have a, I have the um, kind of email and complaint um, uh, process kind of linked in this website. If these slides are going to be made available, it's also right on our on our homepage. Um, but then also, if you're just more generally interested in following along or participating in um, Pure Proceedings, I've linked the, the calendar of events. You can sign up for an email alert. You do need to know that the docket number of the um, docket that you're you know, trying to track or follow. And of course, we um, have quite often um, public hearings or technical meetings, and there's a public comment period um, reserved for anyone to, to provide public comment. Um, and then there's also a process for more formally intervening in a proceeding um, that typically requires um, representation by an attorney. Um, but that's basically the, the bottom line is there are many ways to um, kind of participate and, and provide feedback um, as a stakeholder in, in Pura proceedings as they relate to energy affordability, but really on, on any topic and matter before Pura. So um, thanks again for the opportunity and looking forward to the discussion later. so much. Uh, that, that was a staggering amount of information right there. Thank you, Ms. Cohane. Uh, not just on, you know, utility and state administered support programs, but also even on uh, programmatic efforts uh, in the energy policy space uh, in terms of proactively addressing um, affordability through clean energy being teased out at the front end there. Um, that in cleanup here, the anchor tenant of the energy affordability conversation in Connecticut, Brenda Watson at Operation Fuel. Ms. Watson, uh, we're glad you could join us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. I want to thank everyone at the Green Bank for hosting this series and for inviting uh, me to come and speak today. I um, also want to uh, thank Alicia and Stephanie for te teeing me up. Um, uh, you can go ahead and skip to slide two. Yep, there we go. 
So uh, there are several paths forward to mitigating energy affordability for low and moderate income customers. Um, for now, I'd like to focus on uh, two of the most critical, in my opinion. And um, you might also hear me uh, refer to low and moderate income customers as LMI customers. So I um, just wanted to get that um, acronym out of the way. Um, so I want to focus on the role that regulators and um, investor-owned utility company leaders um, play um, in energy affordability and um, equity-sensitive infrastructure, infrastructure for all. Um, so for a long time, regulators and utility companies have worked together um, shaping energy policy and regulation um, on a, a top-down structure. Um, I believe that this model um, leaves customers at the bottom of that pyramid um, and where energy is an, as, is an essential public good, as both Alicia and Stephanie have, have pointed out, um, it, you know, for as long as customers are mandated to supplement the activities of the utility companies, uh, we deserve a voice in some decision making. Um, so, you know, in terms of infrastructure, as of now, um, our infrastructure uh, outlook has been, has from the past and even um, in the present has, has been unbalanced and inequitable. So hopefully that doesn't happen in the future. Um, so if we continue uh, on this current path of investigating how we can mitigate energy insecurity, um, we can close the gaps and meet customer needs. And some investor-owned utility company leaders have solved the puzzle of um, meeting shareholders' uh, needs and making them happy and um, you know, me meeting goals as well as serving its most challenged customer. Next slide, please. Um, so as Stephanie uh, pointed out, I'm not gonna go through um, all of the text here. Uh, pure dockets are uh, critical in addressing energy affordability and, and insecurity without um, the regulators and without the utility companies coming together to solve for these issues. Um, it's just not gonna happen. So. Um, Modernizing the grid with an equity focus has been uh, one of the most um, learning, eye-opening learning experiences for me, but it also provides a bit of hope that um, we have regulators who are in place that want to um, solve for this issue um, as we consider what a equitable modern grid looks like. Um, and you know, the ability to minimize blackouts, um, having positive health impacts on reducing energy burden, um, reducing air pollution in red line communities and expanding access to clean energy, that's just, uh, in my opinion, very basic. Um, and we can't talk about energy affordability without a thorough examining of how we got here in the first place and what can be done um, in a short and long term. And, and Pure is on the way um, of doing that. So um, I, I also want to quickly note that um, what's occurring in places like Texas and California, um, which happens to be a confluence of natural disasters and um, sadly, bad decision making. Um, I believe that we uh, here in Connecticut are are lucky to have the regulators that we currently have in place that are um, taking a zoomed out look as to this issue for um, the many households that suffer from energy insecurity. Next slide, please. So I want to focus on um, two uh, investor owned utility companies that have, um, like I said before, um, discovered balancing the needs of their most uh, needy customers, as well as uh, making shareholders happy. Um, so DTE Energy, um, which uh, services uh, folks who live in Detroit, um, partnered with uh, local nonprofit groups to increase energy and energy efficiency assistance focused on uh, single family and multifamily households. Um, the program doubles the size of DTE's previous LMI programs and is structured based on local community needs. Um, what that means is the utility company, um, in addition to partnering with the local nonprofit groups to implement this pilot program, um, which started in early 2020 and ends uh, December 2021, um, they empowered those on the ground nonprofit groups who they share customers with um, to help design and implement the program. 
Um, so the goal is to provide service to customers who are at, who are at risk of shutoff annually, and it bundles um, repayment plans as well as good faith payments um, with energy efficiency upgrades that include um, water heaters, refrigerators, um, and window repair or replacement. And um, what I find the most appealing about this pilot program is that the utility company listened to the advocates and actually called the advocates on their bluff. Advocates had been um, wanting to test the theory that a combination of social-based efforts with um, en energy assistance and um, energy efficiency will drive down energy burden for their most challenged customers. Um, and if this program is successful, they will um, expand it beyond 2021. But the other uh, component of this program that I think is most critical is that uh, DTE has hosted a series of um, advocate roundtables in the process of this pilot phase. Um, they're hosting three to four meetings through the end of December um, to um, share data, to talk about program success um, in, the, in the meantime, as, as well in real time, I should say as well as what some of the barriers or failures are um, before the program ends, and then they can work on developing uh, improvements to the program if, if expanded. Um, another good example is Entergy. Um, they provide uh, service to uh, folks living in four states, and um, Entergy is one of my go-to utility companies when I'm looking for studies or research on um, energy poverty as it relates to poverty in general. Um, since 2002, uh, Entergy has really doubled down on um, how to unpack these issues as well as um, investigate, study, and develop programs that will help mitigate um, energy insecurity. Um, so one of the, I, I linked the resources at the end of this slide deck, but um, there's one in particular that I want to point out, the most important customer that was published in 2002. And I'm just going to read the, one of the opening statements of that study. Um, At Entergy, we believe we have failed. Anytime we have to disconnect a customer who is unable to pay their utility bill. And when we look at the costs of providing electric service, the numbers tell us that usually there are better business solutions than disconnecting and reconnecting the same customer over and over again. So to me, that's a signal that um, Entergy has, as I noted before, found that balance of making shareholders happy as well as um, trying to understand the needs of their most challenged customers and tying that to risk management in a sense that um, you know it's just bad business to go after customers who cannot afford to pay. Um, when you know that at the end of the day, you're really not gonna get the money um, from them because they just simply cannot afford to pay. So um, that's that's one uh, study that I wanted to point out to you all. Um, in 2008, uh, they released another study um, connecting energy efficiency with economic development, energy efficiency and energy assistance with economic development. Um, Entergy asked the, uh, the study, the authors of the study to examine more deeply the economics of investing in low income programs that focus on energy use. So Entergy, like I said, they've doubled down on this. The CEO um, has made it very clear that, you know, we're not gonna leave these customers behind. We're gonna do our best to be proactive in how we serve them. They've studied the economic impacts of energy assistance, but they've also studied the impact of high utility rates on the healthcare system and that there's correlation there. Um, they've uh, um, again, studied poverty issues in, in the four states of which they provide service. Um, so they continue to, up to 2019 actually, they partnered with Louisiana's United Way to sponsor their ALICE study. The ALICE study is, um, what is ALICE, the acronym stands for, uh, oh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't, I'm drawing a blank, but the ALICE report um, you know, Connecticut has has its own version. I believe the latest version was published in 2020 or 2019. 
Um, so it's actually asset limited income, um, income constrained yet employed. That's what ALICE stands for. And it's a, a really in-depth look at how uh, folks who are um, have higher incomes in terms of employment are still struggling with the cost of basic needs because you know things are expensive. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I just want to kind of demonstrate, you know, this has not been scientifically proven. This is just me looking at observing um, what's happening around us and making my own determination here that um, infrastructure is unbalanced in our state. Um, so a number of years ago, you might all uh, remember the crumbling foundations um, crisis that occurred to nearly 2,000 households in the eastern part of the state, northeastern part of the state. Um, and, and those homeowners and business owners, they got together and they mobilized. They pooled their, their resources together and got the attention of um, local leaders, state leaders, and even members of our congressional district um, delegation, I should say, to help them because they've, they had exhausted every possible a resource to solve these issues and um, quite honestly you know there was just nowhere for them to go so uh, the the state of Connecticut responded and very swiftly um, and that was the right thing to do we could not have allowed for that entire region of the state to fail um, that would just be economically devastating to the entire state um, but what's happening now um, is you know I believe it was Governor Malloy who appointed a homeowner advocate um, within the Connecticut Department of Housing. Um, their uh, uh, customers like myself or homeowners like myself and my husband, um, we are paying a $12 surcharge on our homeowners insurance to help build a fund to help these homeowners fix their crumbling foundations. Um, a foundation and website were, was established and um, serving as a resource for these customers who um, you know, are, are trying to get the help that they need. And if you look at the uh, leadership on the board of directors of the foundation, you'll see that there are um, a couple state senators and a couple um, state reps who serve as ex officio board members. Um, and to me, that's, that's the signal and the sign of what leaders choose to respond to swiftly, efficiently, to help solve problems for residents who are struggling with a particular issue. Um, now let's take a look at the weatherization issues here in Connecticut or the weatherization program or barriered homes. So barriered homes are defined as homes that cannot be weatherized um, because there's um, asbestos mold and, uh, mold and um, gas leaks or vermiculite, et cetera, in the home. And in 2016, Operation Fuel study this issue and noted that there were 440,000 households in Connecticut that qualified for weatherization assistance as well as home energy solutions, um, but only 5% of those households were reached. And between a period of 2017 and 2019, um, market rate homes are defined as homes that, um, or homeowners that pay a surcharge for weatherization. Um, about 10 to 14 percent of those homes could not be weatherized because there was a health and safety um, barrier in the home. And um, it gets higher for customers who, homeowners who are considered LMI, um, low and moderate income. Um, at 25 to 30 percent of those households could not be weatherized because of a health and safety issue. Um, and there is no place for those homeowners to go really when a vendor makes that determination. Um, unless it's a vendor who cares and will handhold or walk through uh, some of the options for that customer. Um, uh, but there really is no, like there are no set of next steps. Um, you know, I know programs like Energy Efficiency Solutions and Comfort Home Practice, you know, those, those company, uh, uh, those vendors care about the people that they're serving. They, they live in the communities of the people that they're serving. So they wanna get this work done. Um, but often there's just really a, are no next steps for the customer. But I just want to note that 
What I did find on the Energize CT website was a message to homeowners with crumbling foundations. And that just kind of like broke my heart because here we are in a situation where thousands and thousands of households in Connecticut should be weatherized to not only make those households safer for customers, but to be in line with our state's climate change goals. If we're ever going to reduce energy burden, we really do need to weatherize these homes and address the barrier at home problems for these people. But there, there, here you've got a, a message on the Energize CT website reaching out to um, folks who have crumbling foundations. And there's a note that says, you know, we want to help. So it's like, okay, so who do we want to help here? Who do we continue to prioritize? And what is it going to take to get um, uh, state leaders to see that this is a very critical issue for folks who are living in these these unhealthy homes and it's driving up our health healthcare costs and it's just you know we really need to solve for these issues um, next slide please so in my opinion um, the path forward um, is to continue to close these equity equity gaps um, programs across the board private public and not and nonprofit are underserving our most vulnerable and and in the meantime there are 500,000 households um, who are subject to service termination, according to the most recent filing by the two largest utility companies. And um, that's a lot of households, but when you start doing the math about the potential number of individual people that will impact, that's a lot of people. Um, you know, households with single, a person, single person living in it, a household with maybe two people, and, um, and then you just count, count up, you know, households of four, it, that's a lot of people who will be without power in a very um, critical time in our in our weather situation here in the summer. Um, it's uh, you know we've been facing back to back thunderstorms just this week alone, and um, that's just those are unsafe living conditions as we are still in a pandemic. So we, we began to see lower enrollment rates in programs, energy assistance programs, even prior to COVID. Um, and this, that's worth investigating. It's, um, you know, our behavioral economics at play here um, in terms of getting people uh, to enroll. You know, it really is worth um, us determining what the issues are, where the gaps are, so that we can design programs around filling those gaps. Um, despite technological advances, uh, Connecticut has not developed a single online portal for residents. So there is not a single place that people can go to to apply for assistance and then have access to all of the different programs and, um, and products that are available or could be available to them. Um, and again, meanwhile, 500,000 households are subject to service termination. I just want to keep that number in your mind that. Um, that's a potential outcome of our high energy rates. Um, we need a portal system that will link all of these customers to the program of their choice. Um, and, and energy programs from policy to basic needs um, need to be democratized with plain language so that the everyday consumer can understand how to wade their way through you know, the third party supply market and, and again, energized CT programs. Um, and, you know, movement is fast and efficient, depending on who is prioritized. Again, I want to remind you all that 500,000 households are subject to service termination this summer. Um, and that's, that's uh, we have to figure out a way to mitigate that. And uh, we really need the utility companies to um, work with us and come to the table with an open mind and be less defensive about how great they are. Um, because we all could stand to uh, be, we can all stand to, you know, improve our programs and the way that we deliver these programs to people who are struggling. So um, I'll wrap it up there. I see that we're nearly out of time and happy to take any questions. Awesome, Ms. Watson. Thank you so much. Uh, let's have all our panelists uh, turn on their cameras. Uh, we could, you know, we're technically ending at one o'clock, but we could flex a few minutes. Uh, on the back end here just a little bit. And uh, congrats on the asset limited income constrained but employed acronym uh, <laughs> that I took down right there uh, and the memory on that. I, 
I think everyone has at least one season of life where they feel it, right? Uh, working part-time through college and living in a creaky oil-fired home, that sort of thing. Um, so I've got a few questions in from the audience here. Uh, so I'm going to uh, really focus on uh, what other people are bringing in here. One of them is, how do we get landlords uh, to do energy upgrades, including solar and battery storage, uh, finding that they don't care uh, to do upgrades very often? I'd actually like to uh, supply the first answer here, but then kick it over uh, to anybody else who wants to supplement. I'm not sure if um, in Ms. Cohane's voluminous presentation, uh, there was uh, a mention of Public Act 21-48, the new multifamily affordable energy efficiency retrofit. Uh, program that I believe uh, the DEP is uh, going to be establishing using uh, recovery plan dollars to address that very sector. Uh, that is for energy efficiency retrofits. So I wanted to make sure that uh, we did give that a shout out as that's a new law that passed uh, this past session. Uh, as far as solar and battery storage on um, multifamily yeah it's a bedeviled property class when it comes to the split incentive issue i don't know if anyone else has uh thoughts on that that they want to supply but i, I wanted to uh key off of that to make a note of that new public act so i i can't speak to uh any legislation or dockets at this time but i i think that uh that just needs to be mandates just need to come down um i think that the landlords should be split up in three categories you know you're very bad acting large who might even live out of state landlords um and then you have your uh landlords who are considered small business and that you know perhaps they're living in the same units that they also rent out of two or three other units um, and then you have your socially conscious Landlords, um, there are not very many, but I know of a few who their they their biggest complaint is that these program enrollment processes take too long um, for for landlords to see any benefit, um, or for it, even their customers to see any benefit, or the people who are renting their their properties, um, and and that has just turned some landlords off from the process altogether. They're just like you know I'll just go this on my own, or I just won't do anything at all or I'll figure it out later. Um, and I think that uh, it's time to just really crack down on that first tier of landlords, the, the poor for performing ones, the ones who live out of state. And we have to stop, um, we have to stop coddling the business sector the way that we do. They act like victims all the time as if they are, you know, just gonna, it, the, the, the tantrums that some of these these corporations have, it just really is mind boggling. Well, meanwhile, people, there are people at the end of these policy decisions that are suffering. And at the same time, not only are they suffering, but they are also supplementing and holding up these processes for these large, large corporations. Like I said, they're at the bottom, we're at the bottom of the pyramid, but we are providing access and support to these utility companies and to landlords who are not behaving well or being proactive. And I wanna um, speak to uh, that just a little bit as well. When we, when landlords upgrade their buildings and whatnot, I live in a green building. Um, Hartford has to focus on not gentrifying the city um, because it can be done but that prices people out of the city. Um, I do, I'm not a fan of, of, of black people being pushed out <laughs> and white people taking their place. I feel like we can live together in this city. <laughs> I just, I'm all here for making sure that um, those of us who, I, I think renters need to get paid more. <laughs> We need to have better jobs because there's a lot of things that happen in regards to uh, affordability. Like people don't make enough. I lived in that space. I didn't earn enough for a long time. Um, so we need better jobs. We need higher pay as Hartford residents. Like this is a this is multi layered. Um, but I, I need Hartford to steer away from gentrifying because I know this city really wants to try hard in gentrifying. <laughs> And I don't think that's a good idea. But. 
And thank you, Ms. Jenkins, and thank you, Ms. Watson. And uh, on the uh, uh, Hartford tip, uh, I should notice that we're coming to you live today from uh, the Connecticut Green Bank's relocated office in uh, redevelopment zone of Hartford in the Coltsville area. So uh, we're pleased to be uh, closer to the communities that we seek to serve here. Um, and Ms. Jenkins, awesome job earlier in terms of communicating, living the data, which is really uh, so important uh, with that sort of message uh, that others uh, are able to hear that and to be able to speak from that perspective. Um, I wanted to uh, take a note on something that Ms. Watson said about health and safety barriers, uh, the, the barrier properties, which we encounter those all the time in this world. So every other Green Bank webinar, you could probably hear our bread and butter. You know, we're promoting these sorts of items like uh, solar for all or uh, home energy solutions or HES income eligible. Uh, but those barrier properties are a big deal. Uh, being able to get contractors in there um, it, I'm wondering, this is more of a statement than a question, but feel free to chime in with American recovery plan dollars uh, potentially coming down from the federal side and what with them being somewhat open-ended in terms of usage uh, for what localities can employ those toward. Um, maybe cities can take notice uh, when it comes to using those on specialty programs, for example, that might get at health and safety barriers where those program gaps otherwise uh, to appear to exist. Um, I'll, I'll put that out there for an agree-disagree sort of statement, but you don't have to play in. And as far as uh, anything else, I mean, I, I know we're out of time, uh, so let me just check uh, our audience questions. Um, is there a link to the retrofit program that I had mentioned? I don't believe that there's an online resource currently available. For that it's too new it was just legislatively authorized probably stay tuned until later this fall something along those lines more information to come uh, from the state um, as far as also on the topic of websites maybe um miss cohen uh, you might weigh in on this since i know that pura was looking at this through its 171203 rea1 track um you know is a website really the solution for low to moderate income folks uh, or really anyone to navigate the myriad programs and solutions that are out there. Um, and I actually can't see the full question right here, but uh, you, you get the gist of it. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think uh, certainly how how we communicate um, the fact that Connecticut does have, uh, you know, it, it was it was hard to squeeze into 10 minutes, right? The the array of programs and resources available today. Obviously, to, to Ms. Watson's point, there's always room for improvement. I think that's something that um, I've seen the Pura commissioners really committed to, you know, re-looking at some of these longer standing programs and how can we really retool and improve. But aside from that conversation or in addition to that conversation, how do we get the word out? Because um, clearly there are there are there's a greater need than than as we're seeing in the participation levels uh, currently. So one of the things, and and Brenda also mentioned it about this kind of idea. I think of this like no wrong door policy. So wherever a customer or, or a resident may interface with, whether it's a social service program, um, you know, for SNAP funds or something, and then they also realize that they, you know that there's this seat program available, just this, these interlinkages between these programs and not having separate processes for applying, um, you know, providing that proof of, you know, like, yes, I'm eligible for this, you know, based on income kind of thing over and over, at least kind of what can honestly be really burdensome um, kind of paperwork requirements, right, and the, and the processes to, to uh, enroll in these programs. So that's definitely, um, from from my perspective, a, a, a large barrier and another way to hopefully, in, in addition to an online portal that Brenda mentioned, that's kind of statewide, you know, come come wherever you're uh, looking for. If you're, you're initially looking for energy efficiency solutions and then you realize over here you can benefit from this other or you, you realize, oh, there's fuel bank information out there, you know, to, to kind of a greater tie these um, programs that are, you know, being run by different entities within the state and overseen by different agencies. We all just need to do a better job of coordinating. So I know the question was about a website. That's 
I think certainly couldn't help. I know we have right now an Energize DT website that has various different information. Is it perfect? I'm sure again, you know, there, there's room for improvement there, but in, in going a step further in terms of that uh, streamlined application portal is something that um, I think could really benefit um, residents and customers who, again, may be accessing one kind of part of the, the benefits or social services um, available, um, but but may not have the full spectrum of uh, what else is what else is out there. Um, and so being able to ensure that those those programs uh, administrators or kind of the, the face to face with the customers know enough to say, hey, don't forget about this program over here and, and not just kind of send them on their way and hope that they, you know, jump through those hurdles on their own, but really be able to um, to tie it all in together through more of a streamlined like enrollment approach. Um, and states have done it, you know, it, it's uh, it's not pie in the sky necessarily, so. Mm -hmm. right. Getting those community action agencies equipped too. Um, right, yeah, they are definitely an important you know, there's so much we could have unpacked uh, for all of us if we had more time. You know, the, the Take Back the Grid Act, even from last year, and the, the, the way one might interpret affordability uh, in terms of simply paying for your power when the power's out, right? Uh, and are you still paying for it? Uh, I want to provide at least uh, 30 seconds each to both Ms. Jenkins and Ms. Watson because I know you've got. Um, programs that you're seeking to go out in communities with in terms of deploying solutions uh, uh, in uh, heat pumps, for example, or uh, getting out there with your uh, community surveys and the Ready for 100 program. Uh, why don't you uh, sum up quick uh, first Ms. Jenkins and then Ms. Watts. And then uh, I think we might let you have the last word and then we'll just sum up and uh, tell folks about our uh, other upcoming webinars. Um. So thank you all for this, uh, ha for having me here. Um, I feel honored to be here, honestly. Um, so what we are looking to do really quickly with Ready for 100 in Hartford is to lead camp, uh, community dialogues within the city of Hartford uh, to talk about the issues in the city and to come up with solutions um, via the residents of Hartford. So community dialogues consist of 10 to 15 people they come together and uh, talk about their city, talk about where they are, talk about issues, and then come together to figure out solutions on those issues. So it's like, it's very grassroots. And what Sierra Club is doing is just being the guide. I'm here as a guide. I'm not here to tell you what to do, I'm here as a guide. Um, and in addition to that, we are going to do, like I mentioned in my slides, we're going to do um, a research project with Trinity College and Capital Community College at their action lab located in downtown Hartford to collect more data and and be very specific with that data um, uh, and, and zeroing in on the north end of Hartford, which is predominantly black and where most of the energy burden is. We That's our hypothesis. And from that data, we look to be able to use that data to then collect data throughout the city um to and then from there use that data to then push eversource which is a large energy company within the city of Hartford and within the state um to you know work with us but that's a intermediate goal or a short-term goal a long-term goal to um really work and like see the see the people that read the data so. And I agree with the premise of what you were saying midway through that, which is that not every solution is top down, right? It's bottom up from the community sometimes too. Mm -hmm. um, and and getting to another audience question uh, that I think we can cover, what uh, it, and it came up during your presentation, where is this data published by town? I saw that you did have sites at the bottom corner of each of those slides, the slides will be published uh, or this webinar is recorded. Uh, maybe we got at that question, but uh, there might have been something else on the back right there. Um, but uh, kicking over to uh, Ms. Watson for the final word on what Opfuel is doing. So we, um, in the last two years, I've, I've learned a lot, um, having exposure to um, environmental justice folks as well as folks who are who've been committed to um, environmental, just in, ge in general, um, with water and air and um, all of that. Um, so. 
I, I've, I made the connection that it's time to start looking at utilizing our resources to get at the infrastructure needs and help fill those gaps, um, which would then um, check off a number of boxes. It's the health and safety box, but it's also the energy burden reducing box. And um, we're looking to develop a program that will um, go beyond linking people to weatherization, but it would also help pool resources together to address the infrastructure needs of those customers who are living in barriered homes and to also swap out home systems um, that are, you know, emitting that, that are, you know, dirty fuel sourced systems um, with heat pumps that will provide um, heating and cooling and again, reducing energy burden. So we're looking at um, addressing the, um, the root causes of uh, energy insecurity and utilizing our resources to help minimize that. We've seen a reduction in a number of people seeking fuel assistance from us. Um, and we've seen an increase um, in people requesting electric and natural gas assistance. So to me, that's a signal that, you know, if fuel prices um, are indeed a little bit more affordable, folks are not necessarily seeking that help anymore. They're, they're going to where they need the most assistance and that's with their electric and gas bills. So we want to try to tackle that. And much like the DTE program, we want to kind of test this theory that, you know, when you bundle energy assistance with energy efficiency, with organizations that are on the ground providing basic needs, then we, that's a well-rounded approach. It's a proactive approach. And I believe it will reduce energy burden. Thank you, Ms. Watson. I need energy assistance on my own. My laptop's about to die, so I'm just going to thank our uh, uh, folks in the background, Andrea and Emily, for cycling those slides uh, to preview the upcoming webinars. Join us on July 22nd for a history of environmental justice in America and the front lines of climate justice today in Connecticut. Uh, register. That should be a great conversation. And then on August 10th, uh, legislative debrief with uh, select uh, items uh, to unpack coming out of this year's legislative session. Stay tuned for more details on that. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate your company. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Did you need a debrief or are we good?